Good evening to all, and thank you for coming to participate in this uh, meeting tonight. There are several very important questions that have been asked from time immemorial. What is the purpose of life? Where do we come from? Why we are here? Where do we go hence? Why is there so much pain in the world? Why is there so much suffering in the world? What about the apparent injustice that we all face up? What and why are all of these questions have been asked by many, many philosophers, religious people, and in their attempt to answer them, they have created the various systems of instruction, the various religions, the various philosophies of life. But although all of these religious instruction, philosophies, ideologies have added to the goodness in the progress and evolution of mankind, somehow none of them as yet have resolved the many conflicts that humanity is actually under. We have great conflicts even today in our world. We have tremendous paradoxes. There is huge amount of money being spent in the medical world. We have the best hospitals. We have many, many doctors. We have the means to examine all and everything in our bodies, but humanity is still riddled with diseases. Why? We must ask the question. We have great bodies for bringing about peace, the power to actually do it, yet we have all the time different wars. The wars in Chesnia, the wars in Somalia, the recent war in Iraq and so on. More lives have actually been taken in these recent wars in our times than in the Great World War of the last 50 years, in the 1940s. We have the best means of production of goods. We have the best system of transportation. We have the means to distribute the food. Yet for some reason, somehow, we have starvation around the corner from where perhaps we live, not only in the third world countries. We have mountains of butter. We have wheat by the tons that is actually thrown into the ocean so that the prices are kept high while we're having people starving. We must ask why, what kind of attitudes and psychological state of being brings about this kind of paradoxes? Why every attempt of a committee or a body that is actually set up to cure the various ills and problems of humanity only tinkers with the problem and creates more? Could it be that those people that are actually elected to such bodies are also riddled with the same psychological belief systems that bring about the, the problems that they are trying to solve in the first place. We have the best libraries in the world, millions of presses that produce thousands upon thousands of books, and somehow, with all that free education, we seem to be illiterate of the very essential knowledge of how to live in harmony in life, in our relationships with, each, with one another, how one nation may be living in peace with another. You know, in the old days, there weren't all these great machines of printing lots of books. All, all people had to actually learn these uh, easily available teachings by heart or within their own capacity of the mind. Now it's all available, yet somehow we do not actually exert ourselves with the same degree of impetus and spirit. So in all of these paradoxes that we are facing, of all the appearance of the injustices, every man, whatever his color, whatever his creed, whatever his nationality, seeks for some kind of justice in the world. But on appearance, from the present day events, he hardly ever gets it. Is it not true that a man of compassion, a man who has imagination, may shrink from doing an action that will profit him selfishly, but might harm another. Whereas a ruthless man would actually not think twice. He will go forward, do the action, profit, build his empire, and then we, the world, very quickly forget and forgive him and actually acclaim him as a paragon 
of virtue and place him up on the pedestal as something to be emulated, an example for our youngsters. And then we, the elders, complain why the young have lost the fiber of moral life when we present for them such examples to look up to. So such paradoxes go on and on and on. Is it not a great injustice when a young boy is born in a family that is full of vag vagabonds, attitudes of thieving and stealing and so on, is sent out to the world to do just that, and if he returns without success, he's abused and kicked. Whereas next door, someone else is born who is treated like a master, like a lord, and given all and everything. And when our first boy grows up and, and actually commits some thieving and so on, we throw him in prison where he can become even more of a hardened criminal instead of actually teaching him and educating about the ways and means of how he can raise himself out of that state, out of that condition, into a higher state of perception, higher way of living, and so on. And if in his desperation he turns to the church, what is he told? Because he has been stealing, he shall go to hell and perish, whereas the other person, he will go to heaven. We cannot really be surprised when he cries out in desperation, where is the justice in that? All over the world, we have a great responsibility to seek and investigate these issues. We give our people many different in substitutes for the apparent injustice in the world. We have the movies, we have the theater, we have many novels that in them always, mostly, the hero, the good man, the meek, seem to actually succeed. Nobody loves a story when the hero doesn't actually get to be the success in it. Nobody loves an unpopular when the bandits are not caught. But these are only substitutes for the apparent injustices in the world. We have other means of also camouflaging the apparent injustices. We are told by the church that it's all right if you have suffering in this present life because when you actually die, you will go to heaven and there you will have eternal bliss. And so we are comforted when the thief picks our wallet because later we will be looking down on him while he's gnashing his teeth in the fires of hell while we are enjoying the bliss of heaven. Indeed, probably the one who did the thieving no more deserves to be in the hell and in the fire than the one who lost his wallet deserves to be in the eternal blissful heaven. Our ideas of heaven and hell have created so much pain and sorrow in the world. Our belief systems, the belief system of this heaven and hell, has, and, and the glorification of suffering, has caused on the one hand the church to canonize saints by the degree of suffering that they have gone into, and on the other hand, to actually glorify so much suffering that it was okay for the Spanish inquisitors to actually torture and make the physical body suffer because the soul will have eternal blissfulness in heaven. What kind of a belief system, we say, is that? When we look at it from the wisdom of the forward thinking, looking past into the history, then we say it is impossible. But even today, as we sit right here, we may have belief systems that are actually prejudice, that are actually influenced by a fragmented point of view and not the holistic picture, and therefore we err and make mistakes. You may have seen as an example in a program of the television a certain simple process by which our prejudices are actually highlighted. Let me see how it may come about in this present audience. The picture opens and you see an old woman walking down the street with a handbag held in her hand. The picture expands a little further and you see a black man rushing towards her. What do you think? Anybody? You're all too polite. Huh? 
It's only a little handbag. <laughs> so, it's possible, it could be. But the majority might actually immediately make the judgment, ah, he's rushing to actually take her handbag away. The picture opens a bit more and behind him a policeman rushes after him. What do you think then? Ah, well, there you are. That's how it looks like, you see, on appearance. But then the picture opens a little further and we see the black man jumping and saving the woman from a huge mammoth rock that was falling. And the policeman was rushing to do the same thing. But the black man got there first. And so we do see how by looking at the picture, at the world, only from a fragmented point of view, from a prejudice that we may have in our belief system, we may create a whole image, a whole action that might indeed be erroneous. And the same thing goes on all the time. The, we actually color our heaven by the various desires and prejudices of the present life. For the Nordics, maybe heaven is a, a place of Valhalla where the victorious souls drink great quality wine from the skulls of those that they have been victorious over. For the Red Indians, heaven might be a place where there is plenty of hunting and eternal glory. For the Christians, it might be a place where there is always nice singing and choirs of angels joyfully serenading the soul that has earned the beauty of being in heaven. For the Muslim, maybe it is a mountain of rice and rivers of honey, as Muhammad promised them. So we actually project and color our ways of heaven or hell by the limitations of these fragmented points of view. It is necessary to think about what are those psychological patterns that have actually determined our actions so far and determined our actions today. It is necessary to see how the belief systems that the church has promoted influenced our actions. The church says if a young newborn babe dies, then it goes to heaven. And therefore it has eternal bliss. But you and I, who have not had the fortune of actually dying as young babes, have lived, been tempted, have sinned, and therefore we're going to go to hell. What kind of belief system is that? You may laugh, but it has been promoted and promulgated very forcefully and very actively. What kind of a father-mother with the limited ignorance that we have as we will actually condemn most of the children, his children, to hell and the one that died young to heaven? We project these limitations onto God, a, a God that is totally paradoxical, a, an all-wise, all-just, omniscient and omnipotent God who apparently condemns most of his children that live, are te tempted and sin to hell, while the few that die young are actually going to heaven. What kind of a fiendish God is that? If we truly look and think about the doctrines that we have been served, eaten from the rich meal that they have provided for us, and acted out in our lives, then we will see the limitations and the various sufferings that they have caused. Why should we condemn, as we often do, as I have used this example before, a dog that walks on wet concrete because we have a sign saying in English, wet concrete. But we do exactly that when some of our younger souls who may not have yet learned and appreciated the various laws and rules that we have devised act erroneously, ignorantly, and we throw them in jail and we condemn them for that, instead of actually educating them and assisting them to raise their consciousness 
into a higher plane. It is necessary to question the means by which we run the whole society. If we leave our thinking to everybody else, then we should not complain for the mess that we find ourselves in. We must also accept the responsibility for some of the thinking that is necessary to be done. Why should we always borrow second-hand thoughts from the second-hand shop? Like we buy clothes from the second-hand shop. You know, a doctrine is like a supermarket. It's like a department store. You go there and buy some clothes, and if they fit, you wear them. Terrific. And if they don't fit, you change and you look for another. And that's what we constantly do. Some of us are Christians. We find out that this doesn't fit us anymore. Then we change the clothes, we become Buddhist. And we think that that will actually solve the problem. Or then we change the clothes and we become yogis. We study yoga or tai chi or whatever. We think that uh, if we change the doctrine, then uh, life will be happier. But somehow that isn't what makes life happier. That isn't what makes life more harmonious. Surely, all the thousands of years that humanity has been in existence, and the many doctrines and the many philosophies, why is it, I ask again, that all of these paradoxes that we mentioned in the beginning are still in existence, as they were then, as they are now, and as they will be, unless we actually take account of some of the essential practices and essential teachings that are absolutely necessary to tune our attitudes in harmony with life itself as is and not as it appears to be through the fragmented point of view or through the limited prejudice of one type or another, of one doctrine or another. These are absolutely some of the principles by which we have lived our lives. Some of the moralities that move us to action say, whatever my religion says, that's what I will do. Other kind of morality says, what is good for the many, that's what we should do. But what about the few? How can you take the few out of the whole and have the whole not in conflict with itself? How can it be the whole if the few are missing from it? How can we only give the best to the many, but not to the few? What about those few? How would you feel if you were one of the few that is missed out of the calculations? Or we say, ah, the best morality is conscience. But conscience also, the con your conscience might be totally different to the person sitting next to you. All of these are colored and conditioned by the various belief systems that we have. And the belief systems have come from our religion, from our education, from our parents, from all of these processes by which we have tuned our attitudes. And the attitude can keep us away from the goal of life or forever keep us refreshed in the very midst of it. So it is necessary to question and review our attitude. Is there a philosophy, other than what we have actually talked about so far, that we can look towards that might be offering us a holistic approach to life that may allow us to see the whole picture instead only part of the picture so that our actions may not be er errors? Is there such a philosophy? And if there is, can it be only because one mind has actually discovered it? Or is it in abundance everywhere around us? Only we, filled with the whole colors of the various thought forms that we have borrowed, cannot have the eyes open and clear to see it. And I am talking about the laws of life, the laws of nature. The laws of nature are in abundance everywhere. And the great teachers all agree about the purpose of life and they have promoted the means and the way by which you may attain and fulfill the purpose of life, which are the harmonization of your actions with the perfect and natural laws. The Lord Christ said, may you 
attain the kingdom of heaven upon earth, which is within you. And may you have life more abundant by actually letting go of your separatist little life. The Lord Buddha said, yes, liberate yourself from your sorrows and from the life of pain and sorrow. The Lord Krishna also gave the same instruction of how to liberate ourselves through karma, through action. Karma, on the one hand, bides us to the will of life, and yet at the same time is the very means which can liberate us from the will of life, from the will of sorrow, from the will of pain. All the great teachers agree about the natural laws that are the very means by which if we harmonize our lives to them, then our actions can be perfect harmony with life itself and not with the appearance of life through one particular viewpoint or another. And many of us will even kill one another to defend our point of view. Is it not true? One nation goes to war with another because one point of view is actually different than the other point of view. So it is necessary to see that in reviewing our overall picture, we must bring to mind and study the natural laws. Life is essentially one, manifesting itself in its triplicity. The oneness of life manifests in the Christian terms as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the Hindu terms as Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma, in uh, scientific terms as positive, negative, and neutral, and the law of karma also manifest in its triplicity. What is karma? It comes from the Indian Sanskrit word, kri, and its root means to do, action, to act. But as it is the case with ancient Greek words and also ancient Sanskrit words, within the word there is so much more meaning, and therefore in English we have to give many other words to actually highlight the depth of the meaning that is hidden in that one word. It also means character. It also means the stock of merits and demerits. It also means what we in the West might call the law of action and reaction, or the law of causation, or the law of cause and effect. And all of these meanings, even the meaning of work, work as the means of liberation, is also essentially involved in that depth of that Sanskrit word karma. So when we think of the word karma and we hear a friend saying, oh, it's just his karma, don't bother about that, then we must not immediately assume that we actually know what we mean. Karma is a whole science and it's very, very deep. And indeed, in this short time that is available today of an hour or so, it is impossible to impart the whole science of it. And I do not in any way claim that I know the whole science of it. I am only simply a student like you are of the science of life and the art of life and have come to glean the few little grains of truth in my journey, which I am very happily sharing with you today. So the law of karma, the law of causation, we must try to approach. If we try to think of the oneness of life, it is too vast, too infinite, too much. So we try to approach and try to understand a little bit of the three aspects of that one life. The Father aspects, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Christian terms. Or in theosophical terms of the will, the love, wisdom, and the creative intelligence. And in the same, if we try to directly approach the law of karma, we might actually not be able to penetrate deeply into it. For it requires tremendous amounts of energy, it requires tremendous amount of concentration, clearing of the mind of all our prejudices and all of our various viewpoints, and really to dedicate a considerable time in its inquiry and investigation. And so let us approach it by studying three of its bylaws. One of the bylaws of karma is that we become what we think about. We become what we think about. Now, if we understand that our thought 
is so vital and that truly by thinking we can create our character and that our character is not something that has been stuck on us by our parents or by our friends but something that we have created by the way we have thought then that makes us tremendously powerful we can really make a difference because if we do not like the character that we have we know how to change it if we do not like certain qualities that we find in our character which might be of a negative order we know how to actually change it we might choose one of its alternatives focus and concentrate our thought upon it learn what that alternative means how it vibrates, seek to find others who already express that alternative. And in so doing, we will be dynamically creating it in our world, in our life. So, another way of putting that same law, as another teacher has put it, is that energy follows thought. And energy is creative power. And therefore, whatever your thoughts rest upon, that is what you are actually creating. Knowing that very fact, automatically you are transformed from a victim into a creator. You are no longer a victim who, through circumstances, through certain conditions, you have ended up being the way you are. You have created the very conditions, the very means, the very way that you are. And now if you see it with a greater knowledge and the greater wisdom that you have acquired as no longer serving you, in the journey of self-realization, then all that needs to be done is to redirect that powerful creative energy on alternative ways of thinking. And certainly you will begin to build the character that will take you into the next step of your own evolutionary journey. The other bylaw, which is bound within the first bylaw of karma, is actually the law of attraction and repulsion. The law of attraction and repulsion. That we attract to ourselves that which we vibrate with. And we repel to ourselves, from ourselves, that which we no longer actually want. How is it done? Another way of putting it is that your desires attract to you that which you desire. So desire is also a very powerful means by which you can bring to yourself certain qualities which you value or repel yourself from certain qualities that you no longer find of value. Many a people have I known who have desired something so powerfully and actually ended up getting it. But the question is to investigate what you actually desire. Because sometimes the desires that we have, then we get shocked and surprised because we have them for a long time, we forget. They go into our subconscious, we go and then suddenly we get something that is totally a shock to us. And we think, what? I don't want that. So desire is a very important element to inquire and see and to apply your uh, microscope and see exactly what it is that you are desiring. I know of one particular lady who truly wanted a piano. She loved to have a piano, but she had no means of actually acquiring one. She was only a servant cleaning in somebody's house. But every time she finished her job, she would sit and pretend that she was actually in front of a piano, playing the piano, desiring the piano, wanting the piano. One day, she happened to actually be sitting on a bus and going from her work to her home. And right next to her, an elderly lady sat, and they got talking. And the elderly say, lady said, well, I'm moving to another country, and most of my things I have given away, sold, and so on, but there is this old, wonderful piano that I don't know what to do with. And you may laugh, and you may say, oh, just a coincidence. And there are many coincidences, but these coincidences are governed by actual law. There is no chance, and there is no coincidence. All chance and all law is governed by the... By, by, by these principles and these divine living laws. What is a law? If I may give it a definition, I would say that it is a living system by which all the universe and all its things are created 
by which all and everything sustains itself and by which all and everything will attain its fulfillment and its perfection. And therefore, it is the only principles which do not change, but by their presence all other things change. So if you attach yourself and you desire those things that constantly change, then know and behold you will suffer the pain and the sorrow of them passing away and changing, and you will live in the sorrow of the world. But if you desire to live in harmony with the laws of life, because they are principles that do not change, then your <coughs> harmony shall indeed be in that internal permanent sense. And so learn to work with the laws rather than only with the opinions of somebody who happens to be in authority and you think, ah, if he's in authority, he must know. Therefore, let me do as he says. No, use your mind. Use your faculties. You have been granting certain gifts. And these gifts are all the faculties that you have. And in using them, you are able to ascertain what really life is about. The third bylaw is really that everything returns to the source of its arising. Everything returns to the source of its arising. Now, what does that mean? If we really know that, if we really understand that, that everything returns to the, to the source of its arising, ah, well, then it really makes sense. We will question a little more the next time that we are about to actually gossip about our friend or our colleague and say all those dirty jokes about him or her. But perhaps spiritual people don't tell dirty jokes. It is necessary to think like that. Because if our minds is filled with such rubbish of gossiping and dirty jokes, then soon enough, as we said, by the law, those kind of vibrations and those kind of thought ones would gather around us. I have used this example also before. Take a bag of rubbish and put it in your garden. Soon enough, after a few hours, go and lift it up. You will find lots and lots and lots of uh, little beasties coming to have a feast upon the rubbish that you have put out there. So inquire into your own mind, into your own emotions, into your own desires, what kind of little rubbish are laying about there. Because you will know what kind of beasties come to have a feast. It's true. You laugh. And it may be humorous, but indeed it does not actually say that it's not true. So when we know that everything returns to the source of its arising, indeed we also are given the means and the power to liberate ourselves from conditions that we find that are not any longer of value to us. Because what do you think destiny is? Destiny is not something that somebody has stuck upon you, some great god or some great system. Destiny is something that you have created yourself. It is a very powerful karma or a very powerful heavy effect of a cause that you have set in motion that you cannot <coughs> immediately alter. But it does not say that you cannot actually begin the process by which you can develop enough of a counterbalancing action or karma that will in due course alter that destiny. And so it is necessary to study these laws of karma from every angle that it is possible, lest we actually miss a part of the picture. And because we have missed a part of the picture, then our actions and our relationships will be an error, will be in conflict, will produce more conflict rather than harmony and peace. It is necessary to see that many of the apparent unexplainable facts unexplainable conditions and stories in the world, if we don't apply the laws upon them, they seem to be like insoluble questions that we cannot find answers for. But if we apply the law of karma and the law of evolution and these bylaws that have I, I have highlighted for you, then all things make sense. As an example, and you may appreciate that, 
you used to have very cultured people and very rich people that actually used their culture and richness to walk upon the poor and the uncouth and the uncultured. Now you have actually the apparently uncultured nouveau riche who have plenty of riches and wealth but very little culture. And a lot of the apparently cultured people have no, very little wealth. I wonder why. You have a situation where people go into a hospital to actually have their appendix out. And some chance, some mishap happens, and their liver or kidneys are taken out. And we think, oh, a mistake, an accident. But is it truly that? Or is it something that they are actually bringing a balance by virtue of what they had acted and caused in the past? The law of karma, we said, is actually action and reaction. Nature will always bring balance. Nature upholds the vacuum, will always rush to fill it, will always endeavor to bring a balance. And so whatever actions we create, we say that they will return back to us. They may not exactly return in the exact point and way that we have given them out, but knowing behold, they will return. It is said in the Bible that even the last penny would actually be, have to be paid. It also goes on further and says that actually anything that unjustly have been taken shall be paid fourfold. What does it mean that it shall be paid fourfold? In, in essence, it's actually quite interesting to look at that because there are four worlds to our life there is the spiritual world there is the mental world the emotional world and the physical world and when we actually perpetrate a certain unjust action all four are involved and therefore the return will incorporate and involve all four too so any unjust thing that is taken shall be paid fourfold in that sense we have indeed the four, what are known in the East as the great Lipika lords, that are the lords of karma. In the Christian terms, we also have the four apostles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, who are just the sins of ignorance. Mark, who are just the sins of separateness. Luke, who are just the sins of selfish misuse of power of using slaves tyrannically and so on and so on and St. John who are just the sins of sexual passions and the sins of all that sexual desire and so on it is necessary to see that when we silence the lower passions it is only then that the higher creativity can be actually expressed and manifest and St. John is actually the sign of Scorpio, which is interchangeable with Aquila. And so you have Scorpio, which is the sign for the sexual desires, and Aquila, which is the sign of the ego, of the creative flight of a higher order. And so when we actually silence the lower passions, then this creative energy may rise upwards, and upon the wings of an eagle, upon the wings of our mind, we may creatively bring about a world of beauty, a world that is more in harmony with the laws of life. And through spiritual knowledge, we may adjust the sins of our ignorance. And through the realization that selfishness can only breed more of its kind, we may begin to let go of our ambitions for selfish power and actually settle for the simple humility of letting go of our actions for selfish gain and dedicating our actions to the whole and instead of endeavoring as a good book says to plant good seeds for our own harvesting we might actually plant the seeds so that we may feed the world and the hungry so it is necessary to see that good action as well as bad action if we are to, term in, to talk in simple terms of good and bad also binds you to the will of life you cannot actually escape action. Whether you like it or not, you have to act. You are involved in karma. 
there are four different types of action. There is the action that is mechanical, completely mechanical. There is the action that is actually impulsive. There is the action that is deliberate, where you have considered and thought about it. And then there is non-action. But non-action is also an action of a negative type. And all of these actions are going to involve you in one form or another to the return of their fruits. For the effect is bound in the action itself. You cannot separate reading from what you read. You cannot separate eating from what you eat. The whole process of the action is actually, the, its effect is bound in it. If I hit the table, how can I separate the sound that it makes from the actual hitting? It is impossible. So if we know the law, if we know the perfection of the law, then we don't have to take chances. We can actually guarantee the results of our lives. We can guarantee the way that we will come to liberation by using these very laws. If we know that what we think about brings to us exactly that in due course, if we know that what we desire will also do the same, if we know that what we give out shall also return to us, for all life moves from center to the periphery and back to the center again, I defy you to actually go and research and spend your life inquiring and actually see that these laws are not actually true. They are facts. They are laws. They are the system by which all and everything, regardless of how high or how low, is. Therefore, we have the means in our hands, in the very word of karma, of how to liberate ourselves. We have the means in our hands of how to explain many apparently unexplainable facts in life. I remember of one personal case. A cousin of mine got married, and she desired to have children with all her heart and all her wish, and her husband also the same, but they were unable of having children. They went to doctors, they went to so-and-so, they went everywhere. They tried the special techniques of uh, uh, insemination and all the rest that science has managed to actually bring about, but no children. Eventually, they heard from my mother that apparently um, I know a few things. And they came to me in their desperation. And so I sat them down and started talking to them and talked to them about these laws and about this life and about the way that nothing happens by chance and nothing really is just something that God has stuck on us. I tell you, if we actually put all our sins which we complain and all our heavy conditions which we complain about in one big mountaintop, all humanity did the same, and then we said we are going to divide everything equally and give you exactly the same portion as uh, the other person and the other person. You probably will run away and complain and say, no, I want my own bit back, because my own bit was less. So do not fall into the trap of always thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. So when I, get the, I got this couple to realize that indeed it was of their own creation that they were suffering this condition, and when I got them to actually alter their attitudes and their belief systems, and actually try to realize that indeed no matter whether a child came through them or they adopted any other child, a child needs certain essentials. And if they are willing to provide those essentials for their own child, then they should be willing to provide it for any child. And when they actually realize that they are only stewards and responsible souls for the welfare of a new soul coming into incarnation to provide the appropriate and right conditions for its self-realization, and not possessive in the sense that it is my child and it is my son or my daughter, and when they accepted that, and they were very happy to go along with these attitudes and ideas. I suggested to them certain books to read to introduce their mind. And knowing behold, soon enough, they actually became parents. And they had two children, not one. They were twins. 
and not by any special inseminations and special things and special everything. Naturally, because they had accepted their law, they acknowledged, and they began the way of life that counterbalanced and neutralized the sins of what they may have created in the past. It was not necessary for them to know exactly what they had created in the past. I happened to get a perception at the time, and it was that this woman was working in a hospital in some other time. And there were people that were abusing babies and children. She knew about it. She was not the abuser. But she did nothing about it. She did nothing about it because it was not her children. And therefore, the good law of karma gave her the opportunity to actually have no children. And therefore, to desire and to wish and to want for more children. And then to realize that indeed all children are our children. And not only the ones that come through you. And all deserve the welfare, the protection, and the motherly affection and care, whether they are yours or not. And I tell you, such kinds of attitudes, if all men saw that all young women were their daughters, or all the women were their mothers, and all those that were of equal age were their sisters, and only their wife of true, or true girlfriend were the one whom they share, then indeed the world will be of a different order altogether. And the same applies for the woman, just in case the men think I'm being, you know, biased. And these thought forms do exist. These ideas, these attitudes absolutely do exist. It is necessary for us to see that many, many different examples. We take a man who actually suddenly loses all and everything in a stock crash. And it might actually drive him to committing suicide. And we think, but why? Why? And if some clairvoyant researches and looks back, they might find the actual cause and effect and the sequence and consequence absolutely perfectly matching. They might find that during some time where there was conflict and war and people were suffering and so on, he, being in a fortunate position to assist and help, instead of so doing, he extracted every penny, including the gold that was in the teeth of his people to help him. And so, karma suddenly withdraws all the wealth that he was given. Or another, which some other teacher has investigated and found, where a human being is actually very wealthy and very rich, but his character leaves a lot to be desired. People hate him. Why could that be the case? He has all the wealth, yet his character is such. In a previous life, it was found that indeed that same human being in a different role, in a different personality, was actually donating a whole hospital, but only because he wanted the plug of his name for his self-glory on it. Not so that people may have a hospital. And so, indeed, karma brought to him the exact deserts. On the one hand, he brought a selfish character that people hated, but on the other hand, he brought back more wealth for the, the hospital did exist, even though it was for his selfish desire and for his selfish self aggrandization and vanity. Still, it did some good work. And so we should not complain for the things that people do out of vanity either. If we took all the actions that people do out of vanity away, there won't be very much good in the world, I tell you. <laughs> So it is necessary to see the whole picture. And in seeing the whole picture, not indulge, nor condemn, but actually learn to live in harmony with the laws of life. There are many examples that I can give. We have, as I mentioned before, the great inquisitors who actually tortured bodies so that they apparently may save the souls. And then we have amongst us all around the world you will find people who are crippled in some way or another, people who might be hunchbacks or dwarfs or, or have some kind of serious blemish in their physical form. I wonder why. You think that God decided to favor you and give you everything in, as far as your body, and but actually decided to give another soul less? I don't think so. As I said, all and everything comes about by the way 
we think, by the way we are desiring and by what we give out from our own actions, our own thoughts, our own desires. And thus, a return back to us. And so, many apparently innocent people may not be as innocent as they actually appear. And many apparently guilty people may not be as guilty as they appear. It is necessary not to actually judge, as the famous common sense says, a book by its cover, but we always do. If a title is actually a very capturing and enticing title, we will rush to the actual hall where this talk is taking place. But if it's a title that apparently isn't so capturing, so inspiring, then perhaps we will not. And it might be the very place where something of real value is for us. So let us learn to condition our minds and our thoughts not with these viewpoints of fragmented attitude, but with a holistic approach to life. It is necessary to see that karma is a very, very rich law and indeed has a wealth of depth. And we must swim in its shores many a times if we are to grasp the vastness that it contains. There is reproductive karma. There is supportive karma. There is destructive karma. And there is what's known as counteractive karma. The supportive karma might be that which will determine if you were born rich, whether you will actually stay rich. Whereas the counteractive karma might be the very thing that might neutralize the supportive karma and therefore, although you were born rich, might actually at some point lose the richness that you have or the wealth that you have. It is necessary to see that also there is immediate effect karma. You know, if you stick your hand in the fire, the effect is very immediate, I promise you. You have learned that, all of you, very young in your age. And there are certain actions where the, the effect is absolutely immediate. But there is also remote effect or indefinitely postponed effect. Why? Because, indeed, the very people who may have suffered or were the recipients of your actions might not be present in incarnation at this time. And therefore, the resolution, the resolvement of that cannot actually take place. And therefore, it's held in abeyance, as it is known. It's held in abeyance until the appropriate conditions and the appropriate actors are present. Then we can neutralize. So, if you can resolve something today, do not leave it for tomorrow. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is essential. Because if you can today resolve some conflicts with your fathers, mothers, girlfriends, boyfriends, husbands, wives, why leave it for tomorrow? For tomorrow, something may happen, apparently an accident, and you might lose them. And then, the actual karma that you have and they have might not be able to have you both incarnate at the same time for aeons of time. And you may, in your good works, have actually resolved much. But still, you have to remain until such time. It is possible for them to be and resolve in the same incarnation as them your actual problem. So learn to not wait until some other time to resolve and bring peace and harmony in your relationships. Do it today rather than leave it for tomorrow. Don't leave something for tomorrow if it can be done today. And that's easy said, but far more difficult to actualize. But with the knowledge of the laws of karma and the bylaws incorporated within it, it is possible to even change what is known as habitual karma. Because we have karma by habit, do we not? You know, if somebody smokes and smokes and smokes lots of cigarettes, after a day and after a second day, year after year and so on, he may not be realizing that he's creating the karma of very bad lungs. But in due course, he gets very bad lungs, and then the doctor says, you must stop smoking. And then he actually might have to do that. But the habitual karma has been creating it all the time, all along. So what is it, the kind of habits, the kind of habitual karma that we have, that we can see very clearly within it what will be the effects? We have also karma that is individual, karma that is actually by marriage, karma that is family karma, karma that is nat national karma. When we are born in a nation, 
we actually benefit by all the wonderful merits that that nation has, but we also have to deal with some of the actual limitations that that particular national state and condition offers. And if we realize that, then we will make it our duty to promote the highest and the best of our nationality to all and everyone that we meet and minimize the worst and focus the attention on the best of another human being who is from another nationality or from another race. For all nationalities and all races are unfolding slightly different qualities in the journey of evolution. What a great richness if we can actually share and benefit of the best that all are actually offering. We can accelerate our journey of evolution instead of actually delaying it. Our destiny and our state of liberation is in our own hands. By the way we relate with one another, by the way we think, what we desire, what kind of energy we send out to the world, we can guarantee what will come back to us. The law does not say you must plant apple trees. The law only says that if you plant apple trees, you shall get apples, not oranges, not grapes. So the law does not command you to do X, Y, and Z. The law says that if you do X, Y, and Z, then these are the consequences. So learn to understand these simple bylaws. Learn to know the essential way that you govern your life by the very faculties that you have. You do not need some great teacher to enlighten you. Enlightenment does not come from an external source. Sure, someone may stimulate your mind to think in a different way. Sure, some book may give you some food for thought. But indeed, it is your thinking that will alter your character. Not the book, not the teacher, not someone else. So your state of liberation is in your own hands. By the way you think, what you desire, what you send out of yourself towards others. And all great teachers have absolutely have oneness in their teaching insofar as that is concerned. The Lord Buddha said, learn to do good, cease doing evil, when he was asked how to condense all his teaching in one sentence. The Lord Christ said, love one another as I have loved you, because if love is what you send out, love shall return to you. It's a guarantee, it's a law. If you plant the seed, you don't have to keep plugging it out, as I have said time and again, to see if it has sprung roots. You can guarantee that if you take good care, you water it, and so on, it will in due course bring about its roots and grow and unfold in its full potential. And sure, the oak is indeed in the acorn. So learn to plant seeds, but not seeds for your own harvesting. But because the fifth type of action that truly liberates you is the action that is not for a selfish result for your own self, but the action that is done simply because of what it needs to be done and to do it whether you like doing it or not because it simply needs to be done and to do action because it is absolutely appropriate harmless and is essentially what is called for and needed for the good of the whole and to make it as an offering to the one and in so doing you liberate yourself from the binding nature of karma for if you do it not for self but for the one then you are not bound. And if you do it selflessly, harmlessly, and for what is appropriate and good for the whole, simply as a duty, then you are a participant in the whole turning of the will of life. For if the greatest, it is said, withdrew from acting, if the solar system, i.e. the sun, stops shining, then all life will come to an end. So see that by the sacrifice of pouring forth life, the solar system exists. The cosmic system exists. And sacrifice is not a sorrowful thing. It's actually a liberating thing. And this is only comes from the misunderstanding of the church and so on and so on, who have made suffering as a morbid thing. Time has already gone, and I am aware of the pressure. There is the hour plus has actually gone. So I shall stop now. And if you have any questions in respect 
of what has been said or some questions that relate to the whole issue of karma and all that is involved in it, I will be very happy to respond in the best way that I can. Okay. I was told 45 to an hour, so. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you've all enjoyed it and thought it was worthwhile. Now, we've had time for just one or two questions based on tonight's lecture. Now, the lady in the front, yes. It seems very difficult to believe that all the uh, women and children, uh, innocent civilians who are being massacred and, and uh, the slaves and the war that are going on in the world, they it seems difficult to believe they've all been so evil in another life that they deserve that. It has to just sort of well, there have been life. great wars in the world, uh, and the world has been in existence for millions of years, and for millions of years, this whole cycle of incarnation and discarnation has been going on. And therefore, in the millions of years, and the millions of wars and conflicts and so on that have gone on, it is not so difficult to see that most of us, at one time or another, if not all of us, have actually killed, have stolen, have done all manner of things that we might now look down upon and see as evil. But at the time, might have been the very means which we saw as the wise acts for survival or for whatever. So, although it appears to be rather difficult to understand, it may very well be true if one is able to look at the vast array of pictures that go back into the whole beginning of uh, the manifestation of life upon this planet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned about the in, in great depth, but um, if we accept karma as being a perfect law, uh, does that mean that every action that takes place in the world ought to take place, and um, can we justify it? Can we justify it? Well, we cannot actually separate the ends from the means. The actual quality of the ends are bound in the actual means. So we cannot say that if the means are corrupt and the end apparently is good, then the end is not tainted by the actual means. But we cannot also say that the person who is actually unripe in his evolutionary status. We must condemn him and actually throw him into prison or take his head off, but we must be compassionate and learn to respond in a way that will educate this young soul. We do not condemn an apple when it is unripe and say that's a bad apple. We only say it is an unripe apple. So if we have a young soul that may have begun its journey not at the same time as you and I, but much later. In the same way that if you plant some seeds for certain plants seven years ago, and then you plant some seeds only last year, those that were planted seven years ago may already be producing fruit. But the one that is not yet reached that state may not have fruit to offer. So that is not to say that we must justify every action that takes place, but we must see the cause of why certain actions are taking place and what is the status of the actual soul that is actually perpetrating. Is there a selfish motive involved or is there simply the youthfulness of an unripe and immature and younger soul in that respect? This is something that our criminologists must begin to take account and then a lot of these apparent injustices will be able to be resolved. Well, you may, you may actually take a gun and pull the trigger and you shot somebody, okay? And then you realize, oh, God, that was the wrong thing to do. That's terrible. I should not have done that. But you cannot bring this person back. It is impossible. You have regretted it. You, have, you ask for forgiveness. 
but that soul has been deprived from its vehicles through which it was actually going to unfold and it has to wait for another birth, for another vehicle to be created. Enormous amount of work is involved in the whole process. So enormous amount of energy is going to be actually used, which would not have n needed to be used if that act of pulling the gun and shooting somebody happened. Therefore, although you have learned and said, I now regret that, I shall never ever do it again, still there is the karmic consequences of that deprivation of the other soul. So you may actually, in regretting your act, in certainly asking for forgiveness, alleviate and learn not to do it again, therefore not create the same karma, but still the balancing of nature has to be actually brought about. You may not necessarily have to be killed yourself. You may actually repay that by a lot of good service in some hospital of, of needy children. Or you might go to Africa where there are the starving and involve yourself in the work of feeding the starving. Or you might involve yourself in all manner of uh, humanitarian means and ways. And through the cultivation of a lot of positive and creative karma in that sense, counterbalance that actual act. Yes? I want to say one more thing. May I? Which also actually misunderstands uh, 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 when we look at it, we misunderstand it. I mentioned about the young babe that is actually taken away as soon as it is born. And the church says, ah, this babe will go to heaven. And then I said, hang on a minute, if the babes go to heaven, then I also want to go to heaven. Why should God, all of us, deprive us from going to heaven by letting us live longer, sin and make mistakes, and therefore go to hell? But if we investigate what actually takes place when a young babe dies, then we can see the wisdom of this whole mystery of the law being absolutely perfect. A young babe who dies may have in a previous life, without motive and without deliberate and malicious intent, might have just thrown a match which he thought was actually out. But the match set alight the whole field, and a house got burned, and inside it somebody was asleep. That somebody actually died in the fire. But it was not a malicious intent. So karma may actually bring about the balancing of this by the short delay of this soul being born, and then dying away and having to wait and reapply itself, if you like, for incarnation. But the lesson may be more important for the parents who lose the child, because those parents who lose the child may have been parents who might have been given at another time a child that was not necessarily theirs, might have been a brother who died, or might have been some relatives that had the misfortune of dying, and this child was given and to them, and instead of they, actually looking after it in the same way as their own children, they misused it and make it like a slave. And it might be now the only child that comes and then is taken away. And all the love and all the expectation of what might have been and so on caused these people to say, oh, but why, why us? So many children are unwanted. We would have loved our child. We would have wanted to give it everything. Yet it's taken away from us. Or oh, the injustice. So it is necessary to see the whole picture if we are to have a just view of what is taking place. Thank you. <laughs>